life forms. Love scanning for those life forms. Doing my job in Starfleet. What? What? Kruba Joe! What the fuck is up, my dude? Peter, why are you reporting to your station drunk and also clearly wearing a Boba Fett outfit for some reason? Also, what is that music? Drunk and I think also... Hi, man, I was on my way here, and I ran into Little Q, and he teleported me into engineering, but it was a sex party, and dude, it was awesome, and there was some drink with grain alcohol and mixed with Borg nanoprobes, but it tasted like fruit punch, and then I touched Polana's butt, and Paris saw me, and then Joe, I licked the warp core, and we were doing lines of crushed up dilithium crystals. You can do... Wait, 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 Peter. Do you know what the captain is going to do to you if she finds out about this? You're sloppy drunk after some bullshit nerd party that an underage trickster god made for you. He is not underage, Joe. He exists outside of time and space. How oh, bullshit. He's like four years old. Yeah, well, so is Kess, and that didn't stop you from making out with her. Whoa, 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 whoa. Are you seriously so wasted you just confused me for Harry Kim? Also, I'm pretty sure that timeline didn't happen. Anyway, you stay here. I'm going to go get some of Neelix's Leola Root piss coffee or whatever. And maybe we can get you sobered up and, and, and hide the... What? what the fuck? Wait, did he just teleport three cubes in front of us? The Borg assimilated my grandma. Asshole! Yeah, Q2 sucks. It is the fucking worst! Yeah, really, um, I regret everything in my life that has brought me to this point, because it's Feature Please, a for Voyage to the Delta Quadrant. My name is Joseph. And I am someone in a thing you're watching that's only here because my family member is important to it. Peter. Yeah, I was wrong about something from last week. Keegan DeLance does actually have more IEMDB credits than you, but not many. Well, it's quality over quantity, and when I tell you that, the one thing I'm in IMDb is abysmally the worst possible. Uh, you're still not. I'm still not wrong. It's I. Yeah. <laughs> Season seven, episode nineteen, Q two. Boy, talk about something I could have lived very happily without ever having seen. It it took me a second to really think about the last time we saw them. Like I. I thought it was sooner than season three, but that's when Q and the Grey happened. Season three, so it was four years. And and so for us, it's probably been two years, right? Because we, we do basically a half, uh, a season and a half of a year. Brought back a lot of trauma. Brought back bad memories, Peter. Very bad memories, courtesy of teleplay by Robert Doherty. Story by Kenneth Biller. And the cursed a- name. The cursed name itself. Read the last name on, on the production schedule. Read I, it. Th- this is a real low for bewilderment. Um, LeVar, what did you do? What, who who did this to you, LeVar, and why did you do this to us? Like, you're still on the good list because of Timeless, but man, G- Jesus Christ. And this. I forgot for a moment what we were going to be watching, and then I queued it up. <laughs> Get it queued it up. That, <laughs> uh, I saw Q2 on Amazon Prime, and I just said, motherfucker, I I don't want to watch this. <laughs> and I had to watch it anyways. Um, I turned it on without letting Stevie know what it was, because she hasn't listened to last week's episode, which I guess it came out today. Um, mm. And By the way, congratulations on the Herculean task of turning that podcast around in like 
two days one yeah. day <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah i i uh i sent a lad speed record it was a little there was actually it was actually a little sloppy uh there's some cut corners on transitions because a lot of time you know i, I won't go too in depth on this uh, when I'm editing, please, Joe, take as much time to talk, <laughs> talk about anything about else, right? <laughs> like mm-hmm. when I'm editing the show, part of the art of it is making it sound like there wasn't an edit, right? Like clipping conversations in such a way so that you make it sound as smooth as possible is is the magic, right? And I'm still an amateur because I, I just don't have the time to devote to making it perfect. I, I've learned a lot. I, if I had infinite time, I could probably make it sound perfect, you know, or close to perfect each time. But uh, trying to do it in two days, I definitely there was some there's some definitely some hard cuts in there. You can tell when I like cut out some us and uh, some some conversation that just didn't go anywhere, and so I got rid of it. Uh, my apologies, but you know what? I got that shit out in two days. So you did. And speaking of hard cuts, this is an episode that should have been cut and left in a trash can that was then set on fire why now like we had all forgotten you know there was the little baby q after the terrible episode when when apparently uh you know voyager just rolls up with with civil war rifles and that's how they beat all of the gods and uh we all agreed never to speak of it again you know like it was over and he, the last gasp of the show we just gotta roll this shit back out one more time no one you asked and, for this. No one asked for this. You and I exist in a pocket, one of the smaller pockets, maybe, of Trek fandom. I, I don't know. It's hard to gauge anymore. The internet's such a polarizing place. But, like, clearly you and I didn't care for this. Is this fondly received by a majority of Trek fans? Fuck no. I don't know of anybody who fucking likes this thing. I, I really don't. I think the thing we're going to focus on the most as we discuss why we don't like it is the the I actually went back and listened to our our episode about Q and the Gray as part of my preparation for this. I listened to it this morning, and we said it then, and I and it's just going to be what we bring up again here is that the damage this does to the Q as a concept is astronomical. It's just awful. And we lamented at the time when we reviewed Q and Gray back in 2019 that like the Q started as this this force of nature, right? So Terrifying. much terrifying. So much of it was hidden, but what piece of it we saw was this this thing that that represented something so far beyond the Federation and the Enterprise that they had no capacity to deal with it except on its terms, right? They had to choose to play the game Q laid out in front of them. And we speculated then that the reason why Q was doing that was for not necessarily like negative reasons, but so much as the test was a genuine one and there might be more to do with that than we necessarily ever saw on screen. That he was testing humanity and Picard in particular because of some destiny humanity is has that is important and Q through harsh lessons had to teach it to them. And th- that was cool because I, I felt like you can't do like straight on magic in Star Trek, but Q being something so far beyond their capacity to understand as to be like magic that tracks what the Voyager Q episodes did and DS9 Q episode two was responsible for this as well. Is it just turned Q into a fucking joke. Q is on the same level as Mr. Roper from three's company at this point, get rid of John Delancey and just put uh, Don Knotts in there. It could be uh, Stephanie from full house. I will say like his, no, Kimmy Gibbler, (laughs) Kimmy Gibbler. Yes. Q is Kimmy Gibbler. There's your, there's your title episode. All right. Q is Kimmy Gibbler. <laughs> I will say his kid is fine. Like, I don't want to bag on him too hard. He's not an actor, but he wasn't. I've just been so many people so much worse than him on this show. I'm not going to like. Harp on his performance. All I'm that, not going to harp on his performance either, because he could have been fucking it, anybody. It didn't it could have been uh, 90s era Patrick Stewart delivering these lines and this God awful script and premise would have still made it as bad as it was. And I agree with you that 
you know, if you thought what Voyager did to the Borg was dirty, you know, the morgue, the dorg. This is so much worse. It's so much worse. Like, what the Q went, Q in particular, like the Q we know. There's sometimes some levity and some comedy to him, but like, he's in command of the circumstances in which he appears to them. Save the one when he is a human and is like ejected out and it's like the one time you ever get to look behind the curtain a little bit of what's going on with other Q or what the Q continuum is, but also was suggested could have just been a test that Q was putting them through of what they would do if he was deposited upon them as, as they perceive as helpless. That's some of the canon about that, by the way, that gets explored in the books of like, he was never powerless the entire time in that episode. He was just doing that to test them to see if they would abuse him. Is this one of the books that John Delancey wrote? I I don't remember, but interesting thought. Anyway, it, he he comes on to the scene in this episode like he is a conehead. You know, like that he just doesn't understand things in a comical way. Not that he's just so far above them, he doesn't care. He doesn't have like a detached nature to him. It's it's just laugh track level comedy bullshit. The best part of this episode is the beginning. You've got each hub giving uh, a report to Janeway, focusing in on Kirk's um, historic five year mission. And there's a little comedy beat there because he gets ready to go on to the next chapter and then Janeway says, how many chapters are there? And he says, 36. And she says, there's only supposed to be a 20 minute presentation, but he wanted to be thorough. Um, cool. We said, Kirk, we, we got the we got we got the good part of the episode out of the way. Off each up goes and then bam, here comes Q looking. Looking like he fell asleep and woke up with bedhead in a factory that makes butter. Yeah, first his kid shows up, and it's like, WTF. And this is what I want to bring up. I started this episode while Stevie was watching with me. I didn't tell her what it was going to be about. And she was watching, and then young Q shows up. And she's like, is this going to be a Q episode? And then puffy, greasy John Delancey shows up. (laughs) (laughs) And and she literally cries out in pain and says, no! Like, ah! <laughs> and then made me watch it by myself. She left. She's like, pause it. I want to be here. She like took the cat and she went upstairs. Like, you don't have to see this either. The dog is too loyal. He's gonna. She's. He's gonna stay down here. But you, you, my son, you can come with me. I hate the Voyager uniforms. They do not do anybody any favors. But man, John Delancey in particular. He looks like a bag of peanut M M Ms. I mean, I he, I will say this: like he he like got a better look as he got older, and he like leaned into the gray and being distinguished looking, right? Like got got when guys accept that their youths are behind them, and they they take the seasoning time seriously. That that tends to do well because you're you're instead of trying to resist time, you're you're using it to your advantage, right? And now, if you look at John Lance, he's he's got a different look, and his look is much much more uh, put together because it's leaning into that. Whatever the season two Picard trailers, um, if that cue, if if that Gray Fox cue were to come back in time and talk to Catherine Janeway, Janeway be all over, yeah. Janeway would fuck that cue. We've mm-hmm. established that. You had me at gray. But like, this is the time in John Delance's life where he wasn't quite ready to accept that. Right? He's resisting it. Or costuming did him dirty. Or so dirty. He was so puffy looking in that thing. The hair is rough. Everything uh, is bad. Like, LeVar what? Burton might have had an axe to grind. Maybe at some point, John like shit talked his wife and he's like, I'm going to make this dude look like trash. You're going to regret <laughs> Ever running afoul of me, John DeLance. It, it's real bad. It's real bad. Rip John DeLance in 2001. So his son shows up. 
he's snapping his fingers. Janeway's exact. Oh my goodness. Here's, here's a child Q. And then here comes OG Q and like, Hey, let me give you some plot exposition. That's my kid. And he's zany. And we're silly. I'm just going to leave him here for a while. Bye. That's when we actually get to the actual best um, episode, the part of the episode. And that is QG, Q2, Junior Q, little, little Q, Q boy. Uh, he he decides to uh, throw a banger in engineering. So um, LeVar Burton owed some strippers favors. And he promised to cast them in an episode of Star Trek. So he needed a, a titty party to put them in. And what better place than his old stomping grounds engineering. Uh, that scene's dope. <laughs> I believe you called the outfits that were being worn glitter thongs. <laughs> yep. I'll tell you, man. Um, Voyager UPN does not. They're not shy about putting the boobies out there under boobs for days. Yeah, this is probably the most titty we ever see in an episode of Star Trek, I'd wager. I don't know. We just watched, uh, what was that, uh, Red Dress, Jerry Ryan one, Human Air. You want to rethink that, maybe? I mean, I'm saying quantity here, oh, not oh, quality. Oh. Different, yeah. different, different situation. Yeah. But yeah, this is a, this is straight up like Moss Eisley's Cantina in here. Like, there's like the Twilic stripper girl level uh, lack of clothing. Lots of cage dancing in engineering. Bunch of like rando aliens with drinks in their hand, like doing the doing the I can't dance dance. Mm-hmm. This My is the will not allow me to dance dance. This is the actual best scene in the episode because it's just like so goofy, right? It's just so stupid, but also very well produced. Like the the yeah, lighting's all different, and you just have all the Starfleet people going, "What the fuck is this?" Like it looks like a dope party. Uh, so I feel stupid even talking about this plot and, and I'm sure we'll do as little as possible, but Q, baby Q gets dumped on Voyager to observe. I, I hope you really like the term aunt Kathy because you're going to hear it 400 times to observe aunt Kathy. Cause you really can learn some stuff from them and it is boring because it's business as normal of course q2 doesn't get dumped on them while they're in the middle of a legitimate debacle which very abnormal for uh for voyager you have to wonder if q used his omnipotence to try and like book some free time and avoid a legitimate space danger uh but he doesn't like how boring it is so he decides he's going to start spicing it up himself i do like when he's kind of taunting janeway in the beginning like hey let's Let's do this or that, or maybe explode some Omega particles. And I was like, ooh, you're saying the (laughs) no-no word. Everybody on the bridge is going to have to. Does Voyager widespread know about the Omega? Yeah, she had to fucking break the protocol and tell them all what the fucking plan was. Remember, that was the whole plot of the episode. Yeah, that's right. The plot of this episode is basically a very special episode of Full House. Then the the kid needs to learn his lesson, and so he goes through some dramatic lesson learning and uh, comes out better at the end because of it. Yes, um, uh, or instead of uh, Full House, we could relate it to that episode of Next Generation where Q has to learn a lesson and has his power stripped from him, and he's dumped on the Enterprise to learn a lesson. Only that one was okay, and this one is not. It, I I hate this episode for a lot of reasons. I I it doesn't do anything to explain itself. There's no never a conversation between Q and Janeway to ex- really explain why this is happening or why it is Voyager is the place to do this aside from their prior association with each other. Uh, you know, Q's obsession with Janeway has always been just not at all understandable and they they crack wise about it like in one line but like if q really had a son and he really wanted that son to learn from an exemplar of humanity he would be taking him to john luke picard for sure he just would he just he he would just do that he would just take him to john luke and be like here you go i this, this is literally the best human 
learn from him, please. So to script doctor this thing, and this is normally what we save to the end, but we're kind of doing it here. Had the had had John played Q a little different, or Lavar directed him in a different direction, and instead of us getting Kimmy Gibbler Q, we had gotten some all good things Q, and Q were to pop in and say. Janeway, you know, you had a hand in the creation of a new breed of Q, and it's now your turn to do your duty to the universe, and you will impart upon him uh, a virtue, whatever. You will teach him perspective, or he will be destroyed, and you will suffer alongside with something more menacing, right? Yeah. That that authority, the uh, tone of authority, of omnipotence, uh, some of that Old Testament cue. You will do this and you will play your role in a situation that you have helped create or else. Um, or else I will kill Space Mark, who is still in here because we've doctored the script. And then Janeway says, fuck off. And then he whooshes his hand and space mark is covered with silly string and frozen to death like that guy in season one next gen <laughs> the it, when she protests it could very well have been oh did you think that becoming involved in the affairs of Q, the q continuum came with no consequence you chose to enter that stellar phenomenon with Susie q and mm-hmm. and decided to point the the civil war rifles at all the other q you everyone remembers that <laughs> You facilitated the death of Winnie the Q. You cost us one. This is you paying back uh, the debt you owe the continuum. There's yeah. many different ways that you could have put gravity in this situation. And and redeemed some bad episodes by saying, y- you seem to think that you can meddle in the affairs of omnipotent beings with mastery over time and space with no consequences. That is not the case. You chose to rule in favor of Winnie the Q. You chose to let him kill himself and cause the Civil War. You chose to become involved in the Civil War and pick sides and come up with a solution. And it can all look completely hypocritical. And that's right on brand for Q. Yeah. And he's like, aren't you a captain of of Federation Starship? Isn't your job to follow through on the consequences of your actions? Here it is. You will do this. Look, you're also seeking out new life. This is brand new. This is your this is your obligation to study and foster this. Uh, they they could have done a million different other reasonable things, but instead, uh, we get cute dancing around, giddy, silly, uh, and all I can do is look at to say, God, how did this character fall from all good things, the height of all good things, to this garbage fire? Uh, and again, for the record. What was Winnie the Q? What was that episode called? Death Wish. Death Wish. That was not a bad episode. Yeah, and we said at the time it wasn't that Death Wish was bad. It's that Death Wish opened a door to things that were bad. Yes. You know, like what would happen there was rough around the edges. There's some things we didn't necessarily like, but it showed you too much about the Q. It explained too much and. And, and when you explain something too much it, it, and you reduce its its uh, scary unknowns, you do damage to it. And of course, saw that writ large with the Borg, of course. Um, so this is Voyager's worst sin when it comes to just decimating its own storytelling devices by deciding to just overwhelm you with this lore and background and making it so much worse by doing so um kenneth biller caught the matrix and he said wow that scene where the agents erased neo's mouth was really cool what if we did that to neelix (laughs) yeah and they do it to neelix uh neelix you know chastises little q so he whooshes his mouth away and then while janeway's dealing with that uh, things escalate a little higher and they get three cubes dropped in their lap. That's when uh, that's when Q says the most. Uh, we'll call it hypocritical line 
of all time. Well, hold on. Before you even get to that, I, I want to point out that the presence of three cubes at this point just seems silly. Like you're telling me Voyager can't handle this situation. <laughs> yeah, aren't they? They usually just school these things these days, especially like they're not even tactical cubes, Peter. Mm-hmm. Like, whatever. They should have just been like, all right, fire 18 photon torpedoes because we have extras. Hey, throw this plastic fork at one of them and it'll blow up and then slam into the other two and they'll all blow up because that's the world we're living in now. And then Q shows up and says the line that I can't believe this happened. If the Q continuum has told you once, it's told you a thousand times. Don't provoke the Borg. And of course, the Borg showed up in an episode when Q deliberately decided to provoke them. Do you watch your own shows, guys? Do you, do you know that? Or, I mean, was that intended to be ironic of like, now he's the father. So he's, he has to be responsible. And, and now he's saying, don't provoke the Borg when he used to provoke the Borg. And isn't that funny? Like you're not actually helping when you, if that's your intention, that doesn't, that doesn't make Q cool. It makes Q seem stupid. Again, hypocritical is within the character Bible description. I think of Q it, kind of was a thought provoking line to me um, that the Borg could be such a force of nature and such a galactic threat that even the Q continuum has to be careful how they proceed with them because of the damage they can bring. Uh, Not that it was meant to elicit such thoughts. This is just a little gag, but Q whooshes them away. And then he says that, you know, he's fixed the bar rat's mouth, too, and starts kind (laughs) of pleading with Janeway, like, listen, for real, though, you got to help me out because the continuum is not impressed with what they're seeing out of the first naturally born Q. Hey, do we want to throw 15 minutes to talk about Amanda Rogers? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, just... uh... Just acting like that episode just never fucking happened, right? Like, well, again, if you've never watched TNG, sorry, spoiler, but there's an entire episode devoted to a young woman who seems to have omnipotent powers that we will find out over the course of the episode was the product of two Q that decided to abandon their their immortality and live as mortals and were found out and they were killed by the Q. Uh, but uh, Amanda Rogers was allowed to live and, and ultimately took her place among the Q. After, after the bang Riker. Yeah, after. Like trying, you do. Yeah, and having a bunch of kittens. I mean, it's the whole thing. So that episode was definitely one that centered along someone who was a naturally born Q and eventually accepted their omnipotent powers. And that apparently just that just never fucking happened. It completely just... invalidates this episode and the Q and the Gray. And it's part of why this is just fucking garbage and I hate it. Hold on, Peter. Let's center ourselves. Okay. All right. All right. Let's let's take us let's take a step back. Let's let's talk about how bad Q2 is in context of other bad Voyager episodes. Okay, let's Oh, we're calibrating? Let's calibrate. You know, like, I think maybe that's what we need to do here. Because we're only 28 minutes in, and I am already done talking about this. <laughs> you know, like, what is there to say? Annoying child does annoying things that annoying children do, like getting someone to write their papers for them and reprograms the holodeck to beat He's them. just a straight-up Bart Simpson, if ever yeah. there was one. And then he gets on the straight and narrow for, like, a you know, 10 minutes and uh you know q's not impressed so he decides to rebel and whatever it's bad is this i do like the throwaway line uh when they're kind of grilling like what are the ideals of the q and like well you hypothetically the q's exist to maintain order in the universe and it's like there's there's that that green lantern core hint right like right we which we, we which we discussed when we did review death wish right we talked about the concept that they could have hinted that there's a reason the q exists that could belay why it is that the death of the q is unacceptable 
that the Q's existence is important for a reason. And like order to the universe or resisting something that is unknowable or unknown to a race is less, you know, the lesser races, something like that. And I would love if it wasn't under Kurt's mode, had they done like a short Trek that was a uh, played for real, serious, dramatic episode of like life in the continuum where they are actually having to combat some cataclysmic event or something that really pushes them to their limits and have to make like terrible choices and and could explain why Q is such a a chuckle fuck and doesn't take anything serious because he's been so scarred by the events he's been through and the terrible decisions he's had to make that like it's turned him into this Joker ish villain. Right. He's just jaded. Right. He's just I'm so over everything that I'm just kind of like out there now. I can't take it serious. You know, I used to be a man or I used to be immortal and we have done this to ourselves and my life is a hell because I, the, the, the miserable memories I bring forward in time with me or even time as I perceive it. Uh, I'm sorry. I was talking about cool stuff. Please bring us back to the trash calibrator. All right. So is this a bottom five episode of all of Star Trek Voyager? Bottom five. Are we putting this in the bottom five? No, really? What's worse than this? Name Ex-post five. Facto. Uh, time and again. Tattoo. Elogium. Non sequitur. Okay, yeah, all five of those Prototype, are worse. Dreadnought. Uh, you know, I I've got the 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 list of shame on my wall, and I only went into season three because there's so much garbage hanging on this list that I was like, I can't bring myself to put anything else up. oh look at that season three q of the gray right in the beginning i i will say the first five you mentioned are worse to me mm. and i think that they're worse to me than this because those episodes were so unpleasant to watch right and there was something about this that it's just so stupid it was like i i got it went quick right i sat down i watched it it was over before i knew it didn't feel like it even like ran the normal full 44 minutes to me there were boobs yeah there was a whole scene with titties um you know there was there was enough like sight gags that you're just like mildly amused like oh you know q pops into the captain's bath and the captain's exasperated like i I will say that jerry ryan's naked bait back yeah that was a high point echeb as a whole i thought this was actually a pretty decent echeb episode yeah, 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 I would agree, where he's making a friend. The best possible friend you can make, a god. You would th- you would think. Let's save that that thought for later. No, let, no, no. Let's get into it now. There's so you're no not saving this bottom five, though. I, I, you're right. It's not bottom five. I appreciate that moment of calibration. I'm back on the train. <laughs> See, that helped. That helped. Let's talk about Icheb's decision to befriend Baby Q. I wanted our intro skit to focus on Crewman Joan, Crewman Peter talking about how everybody uh, learned to be fearful and and the cue seemed very scary based on our things we learned at the Academy. But since our time on Voyager, um, we've found that the cue fucking suck and you can just brush them off and nothing bad will happen to you. And everybody hates little Q except for Echeb, how could you be friends with that asshole? Well, hey, maybe Echeb's got the right idea. I mean, you're going to be fr- you're gonna be BFF with a god? Like, wow, Echeb's life is probably going to be super duper rad, right? I mean, you've got a god in your corner. He's definitely not the kind of person that would suffer some kind of horrific fate 20 years later. Uh, getting his fucking organs ripped out. That is not something a god will allow to happen to his one and only actual factual friend, right? Maybe there's a short trek we need to see where, um, I don't know, Echeb logs into Q2's WoW account and sells off all his gear and deletes his shit. Or some other terrible rift that happens between them. <laughs> like... There has to be some kind of reason why 
they broke up. They they had a friend divorce. That or or Q two was too busy like banging the alien mermaids on on Cabo or whatever the fuck he wanted to take each. Doesn't of. matter. Q two can travel time. Like obviously the continuum just killed him. Or Picard just. I hate Picard Joe. That's yeah. where the conversation's gonna go. Uh yeah, I mean I, I we can't let it go, but it's yeah, like each have got dirty like that and your fucking buddy Q wasn't there. Like other John Delancey Q, he was there when Picard gets uh his his pacemaker breaks, right? Yeah, which was part of his history. Mis- yeah, it was part Great of the Q mystique episode. of Q. Yeah, like that he's up to something. There's something he's doing. What is it? Don't know. But John Luke Picard is important to the universe in some way, and he was taking interest in him as a consequence. That was another piece of that puzzle. But you never saw the whole puzzle. This is just anyway. I back to what you said though. This is a good Echeb episode. I like the content we got with him. I like that we've gotten a couple episodes in a row. And we're getting a little bit more detail about how he's proceeding with his training for Starfleet, that he's super into it. All of that. It's fantastic. It really is. Yeah, I, I'm i struggling to come up with anything else compelling to talk about here because the kid's fine as playing this role as well as anybody can. Uh, I think at the saving grace of the adult scenes is really Kate Mulgrew, who does a lot of face acting and exasperation and comedic beats, which make it more enjoyable to watch than some of the, the misery slogs that you mentioned as you railed through the, the, the dregs of seasons one and two. That's it. That's all there is to this. And then you get to see sloppy butter fucking Delance <laughs> out there, you know, popping in and out, you know, being haughty uh, while not understanding that he's buffoon. He's a buffoon instead of scary. Q lays a cute little trick where he gets his son to be willing to sacrifice his own life to save someone else. And then he takes them before three judges of the continuum who um, apparently nobody realized that those judge outfits they're wearing are indicative of like post World War three Earth judges. Yeah, like post apocalyptic bad guys. Ma- they're, Mad they're... Max judges, like, why would the other Q dress in shitty Earth garb? Like, if you're going to put them in anything, make them Admiral outfits. It's like someone's like, oh, yeah, the Q, they wear the big triangle hats without understanding what those hats were. I did notice, and I don't know when they started this, but normally Q has like a blue purple tint to his lips. It's absent in this episode. His son doesn't have it. But the three judges do. Which might be worth discussing further if this wasn't a dog shit episode, but it <laughs> it's is, a kind so. of detail that might be meaningful if this episode was in any way meaningful. It might be something worth investigating if the entire fucking premise of this episode wasn't completely uh, thrown in the fucking trash by Amanda Rogers. <sighs> This is just bad. It's storytelling that does no one any favors. It furthers the damage to the queue as an interesting source of plot for Star Trek writ large. It should never have existed. And I don't have anything else to say about it. At the end, uh, things work out. Q and his son become friends and... Uh, you know, everything is great and honky dory. And then Q gives Janeway a pad and says, hey, look what I found. It's a little shortcut. And then Janeway looks at it and says, this will only take a couple of years off. And then suddenly, suddenly, despite three other Q episodes prior, she goes, two, what? Two other. Another detail that might be worth splitting hairs <laughs> over if it wasn't for Amanda Rogers. Yeah, let's call this episode. What about Amanda Rogers? Um, she says, hey, can't you just like whoosh us home? And he's like, no, that would be a bad example for my son. And then he zips off, but he gives her and and I will give that credit to the episode is 
as always, anytime there is something in the plot that builds towards the meta plot, uh, getting home, some sort of tangible difference that Voyager comes out with at the end. Um, it's got that going for it, but there is a book again. I don't know if it's one that John Delance wrote or not that uses this plot point to say, this is how Q Q's uh course correction that he gives Voyager is what leads him to the season finale that he did get them home by purposely having them encounter a thing that gets them home. Is that thing bored? What the fuck do you think, Peter? I read the memory elf. I know it's end game Borg. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Gosh, is there anything in here that I can? They they name check Chell. He's scrubbing plasma conduits. There's another bullion on screen. Is the coolest thing about this episode that there's a Nosican? Nosican are pretty dope. It was a good Nosican too. Good makeup. Forty minutes, folks. <laughs> That's it. That's all you're getting this week. What are we watching? What are we watching next week? Let's all not. Right. Fuck it. <laughs> we out. <laughs> what is what's next week? Author, author, season seven, episode twenty, and there is the EMH, and he's wearing his smoking jacket. The Doctor publishes a hollow novel based on his Voyager experiences, which scandalizes the crew. Hey, I like EMH episodes. Yeah, this is a this is one part EMH episode, one part uh Midas kind of, Ray. It's just the last uh Barkley fo- episode, like a lot of Barkley content in it. You know, this this is this is a big like connecting with back with the Alpha Quadrant and the consequences of the things Voyager's chosen to do. This is good. This is a good episode for season seven. A lot of things happening. This is this will give us an actual hour of content. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. I don't. Why do you all listen to the show? Why did you do this to yourself? Why did we do this to ourselves? I apologize I, for not <laughs> taking 20 minutes on the front end to talk about VR. Like, you can see the ball kick coming, and you just feel like you're statutorily obligated to take the ball kick because we're completionists. And then we take it. And the best thing we can say about this is that it was not as hard a ball kick as some of the ones we took at the beginning. That's true. That's not an endorsement. Do something better with your time. Don't watch Q2. Goodbye. <laughs>